Hello, everyone. Welcome back after this short break following Min Chen's fantastic keynote. Thank you, Min, again for that. But now, welcome to full paper session number one of Eurovis 2021 on social science, security, and accessibility. I hope you're having a great day from wherever you're joining us. My name is Wolfgang Eigner. I'm from St. Pölten University of Applied Sciences in Austria, and I have the honor of chairing this session. The session contains four exciting talks uh, on highly interesting topics, and I'm personally very much looking forward to them. So please also feel free to post questions to the authors already during the talk in Discord or YouTube for the discussion session afterwards. So without further ado, I would like to present to you the first contribution, which is called Vehicle Validation and Exploration of Hierarchical Integration of Conflict Event Data by Benedikt Meyer, Kai Lavon, Carsten Donay, Bernhard Prime, and Monique Moischke. The floor is yours. Hello and welcome to the presentation of Vehicle. First of all, let's go over the problem description of what we tried to solve in our paper. We moved in the area of conflict research. More precisely, we considered the conflict events which took place in Africa over the past 20 years. Conflict events here can be either, for example, nonviolent events like demonstrations or also violent events like bombings or violent attacks. So if such events take place, they're usually recorded by or reported on by newspaper agencies or newswire. Those again are collected by institutions to create comprehensive data sets. Now, naturally, there's not only a single type of newspaper which records on those incidents, but also multiple institutions which record and try to collect this data. So in our case, that were actually four institutions that we considered. And now the interesting question here is, it would be cool if we could somehow combine the data sets, which are here still individual and unique, and form them into one holistic data set that we can perform further statistical or what other inference on. So to do this, however, there are certain problems that may occur. So let's look into them in more detail. For example, let's consider this place here where two events take place in very close spatial and temporal proximity. The question arises whether those two events actually represent maybe the same original incident or whether they in fact represent two distinct incidents. To determine this, there is an algorithm called MELT. It is a statistical algorithm and it works in the following way. So the goal here is to distinguish between unique and duplicate events. In our case, where we only have this one difficult case here with those two events, that would go something like this. So those events, which are clearly unique, are here already classified as unique. Now let's look at this more difficult case. One of those events, we still want to be recorded as unique, so it's actually contained in our final data set. So let's consider this is the blue one here first. Now the second one, which actually represents the same original incident as the one just classified, should be classified as duplicate, so it doesn't show up in the setup here, so those are truly unique. Now let's consider all of the other ones are also classified in the same way. So we end up with our truly unique set of event recordings. Now, this is really cool, but let's take a closer look at how this distinction here is actually made. This is done in a process called matching. In matching, we want to determine whether two events represent the same original incident. To do so, let's set up a matching checklist and see what's on there. So, the first entry, the spatial proximity, is dealt with by the location of the events. Based on the location, we can determine whether the two events took place close enough to each other so they could still represent the same original incident. There's a certain spatial threshold set for that. So once this is clear, we also have the date here of those events. And with that, we can determine whether they took place close enough to each other so they could possibly still represent the same original incident. Now, third, we have the overall similarity. And for those, we have the following pieces of information. One is the actors. So maybe was the event performed by, for example, a violent political group? 
Then we have the type. Was it, for example, a nonviolent event like a protest or demonstration? And then we have the precision at which the event was recorded. Now, to look at how the overall similarity here is determined based on those three pieces of information, let's look at the event type for an example. And here, in this example, let's consider the event 1 to be of type protest and event 2 to be of type territorial dispute. Now, to deal with these pieces of information, we classify them first. So protest would, on the lowest level of a certain hierarchical taxonomy, be classified as a protest demonstration and the territorial dispute also just as a territorial dispute. Now, one level higher, we have the protest as a nonviolent display and the territorial dispute as a nonviolent possession. One level higher each, they both have the parent nonviolent action, and above that, those are both considered nonviolent events, and this entire subtree here is in the tree of event of the event type taxonomy. The other tree, which is relevant here in the event type, is the violent events, and those actually branch up a lot more than this subtree here, but for the explanation, this suffices for now. So now, let's classify those two events here in this tree, and then we see that the first common ancestor node that they have is nonviolent action. Now, what does this mean for our similarity? The similarity depends on how deep into the tree two events have their first common ancestor node. So here, those two events would be probably of mediocre similarity. Now, this is not only done for the event type taxonomy, but what we've seen before as well, the precision and the actor, which both have their taxonomies on their own. So with the similarity based on those three taxonomy, we can calculate the overall similarity. And that's this way we can determine whether the in events represent the same original incident or not. Now this all seems kind of complex already, so um, this also brings us to our problem because so far only rudimentary techniques have been used to actually validate whether the results are reasonable that are produced by this algorithm. This is also important because the spatial and temporal proximity depend on input parameters like the spatial and the temporal threshold. So. Our question that we were confronted with in our work is how can we actually validate and explore the results of this hierarchical integration process? And that's what we want to answer in the next section. To answer this question, we worked together with a conflict research expert. Together with him, we determined the underlying domain problems, then abstracted them into visualization tasks, and those we embedded in an abstract workflow. So the underlying requirements that we worked with are the following. The first one was we want to understand the influence of the spatial and temporal constraints. So those are the ones which we saw before, which corresponded to the spatial and temporal proximity. They are fed to the algorithm as input parameters, and so they are of high importance. In addition, we want to understand whether the number and structure of the identified matches is reasonable. Now, a match in this case corresponds to a set of events that were identified to represent the same original incident. This task breaks up into two subtasks, of which the first one is to analyze and compare the distribution of the matched events and the unique events. In addition, we also want to determine where in our taxonomies the events are usually matched. So where are those common ancestor nodes of the matched events? Then the last, <clears throat> which we have here on our list, is we want to inspect and export subsets of interest. Now this is already kind of covered in those two fields, but this also covers, for example, comparing subsets of violent events and nonviolent events or similar ones. So those ones we embedded in an abstract workflow, and that starts off by getting an overview of the constraint influence. There we look at summaries of the different uh, outcomes of the algorithms and determine which constraints are the ones that we want to go with initially. So once we've decided for one set, we go to analyze all events, both the unique and the matched ones. This covers the tasks highlighted here. and 
that also goes hand in hand with analyzing the entire match distribution in more detail. Here we only consider the matches, but there we look at the different levels of the taxonomies of our taxonomy trees and look at where those matches often occur. So between those three different steps of our workflow, we can iterate to get a better understanding of our data, get a better understanding of the influence of the input parameters, and thereby determine an ideal set of input parameters, and hopefully even validate that the outcome that we finally have is the one we wished for and the one we can trust to analyze further on. So once we have the set, like we said before, we would take the data that we derived and export it for our further investigations. We designed our tool to address the different steps from the workflow. So the first one was to get an overview of the spatial and the temporal constraints. To look at how we did that, let's jump right into our tool. We perform multiple runs of the matching algorithm, each with different spatial and temporal constraints. They are listed here, each run represented as a histogram, and they are aligned so the spatial constraint loosens from left to right, and the temporal constraint loosens from top to bottom. When we look into the individual histograms, we can get the following information. First of all, we have the fill color as the number of matches that were found. So we can see here when going from top to bottom and left to right, so when loosening the constraints, the number of matches that were identified increases, which seems reasonable. In addition, each histogram gives us an idea of how good the matches were that were found for the corresponding parameter constraints. So for example, let's consider this case here, where we have a spatial distance of at most 25 kilometers and a temporal distance of at most one day that may occur between events for them still to be matched. So in here, we can see that the match quality is represented through the match score. And that depends on how similar the events were to each other that were matched in this algorithm here. The closer to zero the match score is, the more similar the corresponding matches were. So we can see, once again, when loosening the constraints, that the match quality decreases a little. And that's seen because the histograms shift their weight a little more to the right. In addition, we try to get an idea of how similar the overall structure of the outcomes of the matching algorithms are to each other, and that we mapped to the dissimilarity score. This one is represented through bars here between the different outcomes, and it allows us to determine where the strongest change in the outcome occurs. So here clearly it takes place between 0 and 5 kilometers, and this can also be seen when we compare the counts here, which drastically increase when loosening the constraint there. Once we identify a parameter combination that seems best for us, we continue to the next workflow step. With the analysis of all events, three requirements were associated. One was to understand whether the number and structure of the identified matches was reasonable, and a subtask of that was to analyze and compare the distribution of the matched and unique events. In addition, we wanted to inspect and export subsets of interest. So let's look at how we solved this in our tool. So here we have a map, a spatial temporal map, where each event is represented as a point cliff, and that is connected by a line to the timeline here on the outside to represent the date. This way, when we go here, hovering over this histogram in which we have aggregated the events, we can already get an impression of where clusters of events were. In the view, the color pink represents events that were identified as being unique, and blue events that were identified as matches or participating at a match. Now, if we say we wanted to focus on a more narrow time here, let's say we look at the area at around 2012, then we could either do this by dragging and dropping this filter or by just entering manually the corresponding dates up here if we wanted to have a more precise date. But that should suffice for now. And now let's look again at what we have. So we can see here when hovering over the different interval bins that some structures show, like for example, this country here seems to have quite a lot of matches compared to the other countries. We can also see for certain countries uh, where peaks 
in the events were, and this way we can explore the data a little. And at some point we might, for example, say, uh, yeah, this country here with most of the matches, we want to focus on that. So by clicking, we can zoom into this country. And now again, we can see a certain pattern. And that is that most of the matches seem to occur in the northern half. So if we wanted to look even closer at that, we could take a rectangular brush here and look more precisely into that. Now we've focused on a lot of matches here and uh, we can see up here in the minimap that we also have a representation of the spatial and temporal zooming that we have performed. Now if we want to closer inspect what the events here actually are, we can go into the second view and that is here to the right. The view shows the distribution of the events across the different attributes. It uses bar charts for that, and the colors here used in those stacked bar charts are the same as the ones on the left in the spatio-temporal map. They are determined by the primary attribute here, which is the match info, and we can see that, again, like we said before, the unique ones are pink and the match ones are blue. Now, some other insights that we can already get, if we look at the dataset scat here, we can see that almost all of its events are matched. We can also adjust the baseline here so we can better compare the different stacks of the bar chart. Another interesting insight is that most of the events that occur here in our selected subset are of type violent event. Now to get an idea for which attribute allows the best distinction of our values of the primary attribute here, we can use the reorder attribute access functionality. It shows us that the event type allows the best distinction. So we can now, for example, drill into the taxonomies that underlie this event type taxonomy to get a better understanding what events precisely occur here in our data. If we want to see the hierarchy a bit more precisely, we can toggle the view up here. Now, if we've drilled down to a certain level and we want to drill up again, we can do that as well. In addition, we have the option to filter out data. Let's say, for example, we want to focus only on a specific type of data now. Let's say the unique events. For that, we deselect the matched events here and then hit apply filter. Now we can see that both views updated, which works the same in both directions. So let's say if we filtered into a region more over here on the left in the map, it also updates the view on the right. Now with those techniques, we already have a few ways to address those two requirements. For the third one, we have the option in our tool to change the primary attribute. We could, for example, change it to the event type. Then the color coding, which allow us to distinguish, for example, between nonviolent and violent events, and we could get an idea of how they distribute across space and time and across the other attributes. Now, to get a better understanding for how exactly the matches are built, we continue to the next section. To analyze the match distribution more deeply, we again want to understand the structure of it, but this time by looking deeper into the taxonomies. And in addition, we also again want to inspect subsets. So how we did this in our tool is the following. So to the left again, we see a temporal and spatial temporal map like we saw it before. Here we can see the distribution across space and time of the matches, we can see there are certain focus points here. To the right, we see a graph-like structure which shows us on which levels in the different taxonomy trees the events were usually matched together. So for example, here for the node violent attack, if we consider a event of within regime violence and one of opposition-led violence, those two would be matched here on the node of violent attack. So this would increase its count. And the count then again is represented by, on the one hand, the fill color, and on the other hand, the length of the surrounding arc section around this node. In this view, we can also collapse subtrees to get a better overview. Now, for example, we could also filter out certain parts of our tree. Let's say we want to focus on the nonviolent events, the tree which we also know from before. If we deselect the violent events and hit apply filter, then we see that the corresponding events involved with violence are removed. 
To better compare different filtering steps, we employ so-called loss and gain arcs to indicate where matches were lost or gained over a previous filtering step. In this case, only matches were lost, which is indicated by a number of red arcs here. Now, if a node actually gained matches over the previous filtering step, for example, by undoing a filtering, then the corresponding section would be colored green. Now, as we've seen all of the components that feed into our system, we can now look into what were the insights from our work and what we can take away from it. To sum up, the final tool with all the components in place looks like this. In the top left, we have our parameter overview, to the left, we have our spatial temporal map, and to the right, we can either analyze matches only or all events together, depending on the analysis scope. The scope can be set up here, and we can export our data up there. In addition, we can undo and redo certain filtering steps up here. To evaluate the tool, we had five sessions with five conflict research experts. Each of the sessions lasted up to 90 minutes, and in the sessions, we first explained the tool to them, and afterwards, they had the option to explore it on their own, if necessary, with our assistance. Afterwards, they filled out a questionnaire consisting of five-point Likert scale questions. They rated the different components and how well they liked the tool overall. So, for the parameter overview here on the top, we can see that the feedback regarding visualization and interaction was pretty good. Even better, it was for the spatial temporal map. However, for the overview of all events, we see that there were some struggles with that view. And then for the match view again, the feedback was pretty positive. So overall, we can say that the two radial views were accepted best with the spatial temporal map leading, then followed by the parameter overview, and then by the bar chart view. In addition, all experts strongly agreed that the linking between the different components was well done and that they would want to use the tool in the future once it's finally released. Some of the qualitative feedback of the experts include that they liked how the tool could be used for robustness checks and that it provides a much deeper look into the integrated data. In addition, terms they used to describe the tool were such as interesting, intuitive, and straightforward. However, on the other hand, they also said that it should not be more complex as you have to think a little about how to interpret the information. This also reflected in the feedback for the bar chart view from the questionnaire. In addition, some would have liked to see a few more details here and there. Summing up, we can say that we have developed a tool that allows analysts to validate and explore the hierarchical integration of conflict event data, while the tool, due to its complexity, should be considered an expert tool. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Benedict. First of all, congrats to the highly professionally produced presentation. Very nice to look at. Thank you. Um, and, but let's talk about the content of the talk, which is uh, nonetheless very interesting. Um, there are two questions already uh, posted uh, on Discord, mm -hmm. and I'm going to start with the first one by, by Jason Dykes. It says, presumably the nature of the spatial footprint has an effect too. So like distinguishing, is it a crisp point, a polygon, of, or even a fuzzy uh, coordinates? Um, can you talk a little bit about these uncertainties um, that are related to the data itself? Yeah, so certainly. Uh, yeah, I totally agree that this would uh, be of interest. Uh, the data set that we worked with uh, or the data sets, they were processed in a way that for each uh, event, we only had one specific date and one specific location. So a combination of longitude and latitude. And so we didn't really have a spatial footprint or an extent in that way. But uh, if we had this information, uh, yeah, we could somehow classify it into different classes and add it as an additional attribute for the matching. And then that would certainly be of interest and certainly uh, give further insight. I think the same could also be done with regard to the temporal dimension because there also the different events were actually given like just unique date uh, timestamps. But if we had a temporal interval of longer ongoing conflict, then this would also just give more insights. And yeah, I think it could also be integrated as just another attribute uh, with a corresponding taxonomy. Thank you very much. We, we have time maybe for one more quick question, an observation maybe also posted by Tim Geritz. 
um, who wrote like, while looking through the data, did you see that different countries or regions widely disagreed on the classification of events? So is that, that what one country classified it as one thing and the other, and, and how did you deal with that? Yeah, so that's very interesting because I think for that, it's not easy to say where this comes from, right? Because if you consider two countries, one reason could be for like, let's say that in one of them, uh, there are a lot of more violent events than in the other one. Um, it could either be that those are like falsely classified as violent events, but in fact, there could also be just simply more violent events in one of those countries. So uh, tracing back that is probably not the easiest thing, but it's certainly interesting to look into that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so in the interest of time, I have to switch to the uh, second talk and would like to ask Benedict to answer any other questions, maybe directly in Discord afterwards. Yeah. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce the second um, talk of the session uh, called Topography of Violence, Considerations for Ethical and Collaborative Visualization Design by Fabian Emel, Victoria Brüggemann and Marian Dirk. Please, the floor is yours. Welcome to our presentation of the paper Topography of Violence considerations for ethical and collaborative visualization design. My name is Fabian Emel and I'm presenting joint work with Victoria Brüggemann and Marianne Dirk that we carried out at the UC Lab of the Fachhochschule Potsdam in collaboration with the Jewish Museum Berlin. This research is about collaborative visualization design that is concerned with ethical questions arising from sensitive historical data. Topography of violence is the name for a set of visualizations that resulted from the design-oriented research collaboration with the Jewish Museum Berlin. These visualizations convey information about numerous acts of anti-Semitic violence that were committed between 1930 and 1938 in the German Reich. The visualizations include an animated wall map and an interactive media station which are both on display at a new permanent exhibition of the museum. The interactive media station's visualization has also been published as a separate web application. Our research starting point was the challenge to find an appropriate and sensitive way to visualize records of anti-Semitic acts of violence in the context of a museum. More generally, we ask ourselves, how can we find visual forms and interactive representations for sensitive historical data? Our work relates particularly to data visualization with the humanities and to ethics in data visualization. Over the last decade or so, we have seen a flourishing of data visualization in cultural institutions and for educational purposes. This work also builds on considerable prior work on ethics and criticality in data visualization, advancing the need to consider ethics, empathy, emotion, persuasion and power in data visualization. While we extensively draw from this work, we noticed a lack of practical implications for collabor collaborative visualization design that incorporates ethical considerations. Based on this prior work on ethics and mapping and visualizing data, we formulate four ethical aspirations as propositions for an ethical orientation of the visualization design process. Ethical aspiration number one. Involve target groups and domain experts actively in all relevant decisions of the design process to ensure an appropriate and sensitive outcome. Ethical aspiration number two, openly communicate limitations of the underlying data set throughout the process and the resulting visualization. Ethical aspiration number three, Consider unintended associations with visual encodings and practice sensitivity and care in the use of symbols and other visual forms. And ethical aspiration number four, support various levels of engagement with the visualization and the overall topic. These aspirations form the guiding structure for the collaborative design and research process that we've been conducting with the museum. To assess the viability of the ethical aspirations, we present a, present a case study about the visualization of his sensitive historical data. To be even more concrete, we focus on the visualization of sensitive historical data in a museum setting with the involvement of historiographical and museological expertise. For this research, we cooperated with the Jewish Museum Berlin, 
which is a public museum that thematizes Jewish life and culture in Germany's present and past. The project's core team consisted of seven people, four from the Jewish Museum Berlin and three members of the UC Lab. Two of the museum's staff members are experts in digital publishing. One is the chief archivist that is, has also a research background in Judaism. And one is the curator of, of the exhibition section. The three members of our research group uh, have backgrounds in interface design, information utilization, and digital humanities. Our research project was part of the redesign of the museum's permanent exhibition. The exhibition section, and therefore also our research, focuses on a crucial time span in the history of Jewish life in Germany, the years 1930 to 1938, during which the National Socialist Movement seized power over Germany. In this time, violence against German Jews rose rapidly and their lives were increasingly threatened. The aim of the case study was to design two visualizations, showing the rising number of anti-Semitic attacks in the years 1930 to 1938. The first of those desired visualizations is an animated wall map. It will be placed in the exhibition space and visualizes the acts of violence geographically and chronologically. In addition, we aim to design an exploratory interface that allows for in-depth research during the exhibition visit or via the museum's website. The dataset underlying our work is a combinatorial result of the prior meta-study by Fritsche and Kreuzmüller and of a second dataset containing historical information about all known German synagogues at this time. This merged dataset includes 4,660 acts of violence, each with information like its geographic location, its date, information about perpetrators, a descriptive text, or historic sources. Each attack is categorized based on its target. It can be directed against Jews, against Jewish organizations, or Jewish businesses. The dataset also contains some biases. While the first years are generally well researched, the records tend to be incomplete for the later years. In addition, sparsely populated rural areas are often fully researched, while the data about cities tends to be incomplete. To describe the usage of the ethical aspirations further, we now give you some in in insights into our actual design process. To kick off the design phase, we conducted a co-design workshop. Its results served as a basis for the following conception and visual design. They also ensured the implementation of the ethical aspirations. Therefore, we formulated three concrete objectives for the real realization of the workshop. First, expectations of experts. We researched which associations and knowledge the animated wall map should convey. Second, suitability of visual representations. We wanted to discuss which visual forms correspond to the expert's expectations and are therefore suitable for use in the visualization. And third, relevant perspectives on data. We aim to find out which parts of the data and which perspectives on them might be interesting for the museum's visitors. Based on these objectives, we decided for three methods to be used during the workshop. First, a brainstorming session on the desired effect of the animated wall map. Second, a discussion about appropriate visual forms. And third, the design of collages to open up new perspectives on the available data. While you can read all details of the workshop, its methods and results in the paper itself, we want to highlight one specific method now. To facilitate a productive exchange about suitable visual forms for the visualization, 26 visual artifacts were selected as a basis for discussion. You can see them in these photographs. The visuals were ex excerpts from existing visualizations or maps, but could also be purely artistic or completely abstract artworks. The artifacts represented a wide graphic range of different colors, shapes, visual complexity, and were chosen with this diversity in mind. We intended to expand the participants' imagination about possible visual aesthetics and encourage them to articulate visual ideas using the examples. This resonates with the ethical aspiration number three. During the discussion, the participants examined the visual artifacts one by one and gradually sorted them into two groups. While a large part of the artifacts did not appear to be suitable to use, several of the artifacts, which can be seen in the left image, seem to be interesting and worth the follow. It is noticeable that there was a broad agreement among the participants on some points, such as the rejection of color or specific visual forms. This stemmed mostly from a historiographic and Judaistic perspective, 
It has to be carefully weighed to the need for visual representation against an inappropriate choice of forms. For example, one should not replicate the oppressor's visual language or show the violence as something that just happened naturally, like clouds or wildfire. Our ideation and design process was guided by the ethical aspirations and by regular exchanges with our collaborators. Throughout the design process, it was helpful that the participating experts were familiar with both the historic references and the museum's expected target groups. According to the iterative approach and ethical aspirations, we produced a large number of variants and intermediate results that we evaluated with the domain experts. This iterative approach ensured that the design visualizations represented the topic and the data in an appropriate and sensitive way. As both design visualizations are part of a single project, we aim for them to have a common and coherent visual language, both in terms of the visual design and the encoding. We therefore started to develop a fundamental visual representation as a base and derived both the wall map and the exploratory interface from it. First, we approached the challenge to symbolize each single attack. We made two fundamental decisions. All attacks are visible at any given time, and each of them is represented by a categorized symbol. Subsequently, we defined three criteria to evaluate potential solutions for categorized symbols. First, power of expression. All symbols must have equal power of expression, and thematic symbols must not be used as generic shapes. Second, differentiability. All symbols must be easily distinguishable from each other. Third, formal language. All symbols must appear in an equal and fitting graphic style. Those criteria were used to evaluate a range of possible symbols. To name just three of the rejected ones, the use of generic shapes appeared too arbitrary and not connected to the visualization's topic. Auto-generated shapes turned out to be too complex and Hebrew glyphs appeared to convey a meaningful symbolization, but were clearly rejected by experts and Jewish collaborators. Our final concept comprised the graphic modification of the Star of David, a central symbol of Judaism. The Star of David is formed by two triangles interwoven in the shape of a hexagon. To represent three categories in the visualization, the star was geometrically de deconstructed to extract three hexagons. The usage of these shapes also offers the possibility of visually representing combinations of categories. In talks of experts, these symbols found broad approval since they established new visual forms while being slightly reminiscent of traditional Jewish symbols. As mentioned before, another important visual variable to consider is the usage of color. It is known that, that colors can have an associative effect even when they are not directly linked to a specific symbolic meaning. During the co-design workshop, all participants consistently expressed that some, that some colors had a suggestive impact on them or that colors led to unintended and unsuitable associations. We therefore limited the visualization's color use to achromatic colors only. It is also important to think about spatial alignment of dense features when dealing with a cartographic visualization. To prevent overlaps and preserve the impression of irregular geographic patterns, we use the circle packing algorithm. Based on the fundamental visual representation, we developed two visualizations. The animated wall map runs through the years 1930 to 1938 at a constant speed of about one second per month. For each act of violence, a symbol fades in once the event state is reached. All symbols remain on the map until the end of the animation, which creates an additive, complete representation of the assaults. The simultaneous presence of all prior attacks reflects the increasingly growing pressure and the high density of violence against the Jewish population. The speed of the individual transitions is not the same for all symbols, but is slightly randomized in several points to create subtle visual differences. The larger symbols also change their opacity and size randomly against the trend, and they are though displayed larger and more transparent for a fraction of a second. Animations adapted in this way appear less peaceful or fluid and more abrupt, disturbing or violent, to appropriately convey the violent character of the assaults. The exploratory interface is intended to be used on a touch screen in a museum or as a web-based version. It consists of three parts. The filter panel on the left allows to switch visualization modes or perform a full-text search. 
the visualization itself is uh, can be seen in the main view in the center. And on the right, we have a list panel that shows information about all displays attack in the scrollable list view. The interface is available both in English and in the German version, and more details about it can be found in the paper. We now want to critically reflect the described work. The defined ethical aspirations that you can see again here formulated a set of desirable outcomes for our project and helped us to discuss and check decisions in the project's process. Based on our observations, on feedback from others, as well as the relevant literature, we want to share critical reflections along the ethical aspirations. They culminate in potential future work and could serve as anchor points for ethical visualization design. First, limits to involvement. The involvement of experts from historical, Judaistic and museological backgrounds has significantly contributed to the design process, especially to idea generation and deliberation about different variants. Still, there have arguably been limits to the involvement in the design process, mainly including an even more diverse group. For example, the involvement of victims or their descendants would have been a valuable addition. Furthermore, an evaluation of the prototype was unfortunately not possible due to pandemic-related restrictions. We would nonetheless recommend to aim for an evaluation phase. Second, levels of engagement. As described before, it is desirable to support various levels of engagement of diverse groups with the visualization and the overall topic. In general, discursive and public formats should already be fostered during the project. This could also be the involvement in conferences or support of media coverage. Third, data issues. We took several measures to communicate and reduce the impact of the data's limitation. It is described in an introductory text and in the visualization, and it is possible for visitors to submit new cases. Nonetheless, we believe there is still a need to develop new specialized visual forms and data narratives that can take these issues into account. The same goes for the challenge of showing individual fates against broad patterns, an issue that occurred due to the inconsistency in the data concerning the wealth of information on single cases. And fourth, visual sensitivity. An ethical approach to visualization design needs to consider unintended associations with visual encodings. This is especially true as symbols and statistic, statistic representations can it also have been used in a deeply unethical way. For example, the National Socialists have used the Star of David and statistical methods and infographics against Jews. Visual forms can also disguise individual fates. Therefore, how to include a reflection on such historical and recent discussions in visualization has to be discussed further. This leads us to summary and future work. We introduced four ethical aspirations as initiation points and examination methods for ethical design processes. By applying these ethical aspirations to our project and presenting the results through a design study, we hope to shed light on collaboratory processes and inspire others to include these aspirations into their projects. The aspirations have also led us to critical reflection of our own process and visualization prototype. However, these reflections are based solely on one case study. We see great potential for future research in widening this view and developing more robust guidelines based on the experiences from several comparable projects. Especially, we would like to open the discussion now and in the future on the following points. We think that it is worth to think about and design new visual forms which acknowledge gaps and biases in data and highlight individual fates in an abundance of data points. In addition, we recommend to think about increasing the levels of participation, involvement and engagement in project settings. Third, future work could foster the development of structured evaluation formats to test for ethical concerns in data visualizations. This was our presentation of our paper Topography of Violence, Consideration for Ethical and Collaborative Visualization Design. And I'm happy to take your questions.
Thank you very much for this impressive work with, I think, both particularly high impact in practice and at the same time raising highly important questions also for um, visualization theory. So um, gonna maybe start with a question uh, by myself, uh, mm -hmm. waiting for, for the questions from the audience. Um, one thing I'm particularly interested in is, is that uh, also your methodological approach uh, that you also described in the paper and in the presentation. So could you talk a little bit more about this co-design workshop uh, that, that you that you ran there, specifically like the collages I found very interesting. So the materials for that, did you like collect that specifically for that project or is it kind of a standard set uh, you use uh, as a method in similar projects? We especially collected those materials um, for the specific workshop because uh, like the collages were also about the specific topic. So we needed, um, we needed photographies and texts and, uh graphics and all this kind of stuff to uh, match the specific topic so we we just collected it um for this workshop and it was pretty interesting to see what the participants um did with it like our our main goal or aim is to understand how they see the topic and and how we can find a common language and a common base to to talk about uh, such a topic that is very specific in its um, ethical um, difficulty. So this was a really good and kind of playful way to, mm -hmm. to, to see their view on the topic and, and to also to see what kind of material they pick, because this shows the focus they have on the, on the topic itself. Thank you very much. And, and maybe pointing to, to, to another aspect, like from my own experience, like in working in, in visualization projects in the context of museums, mm -hmm. um, I always found it very difficult to, to like um, find a more specific user group than kind of the general museum visitor uh, with all ages. So, so mm -hmm. how, how did you deal with that issue? Yes, so we had a, we could not really, because the museum was closed while we were working on it, so we could not really do research there, but we have to, we had information from the museum staff. Uh, and we also talked about who would be interested in such a visualization. Um, for example, the this interactive terminal that you could see there is especially useful for the guides who run through there with um, school classes, for example, or with visitor groups. And it's very useful because somebody can say, hey, we, I'm from, from Munich, for example, and then they can type up Munich and can see what, what shows up there. Um, so we had these kind of user groups in mind, but I think it's, we also try to, to, um, to design something that is interesting for every user group. So if you don't want to interact with it because you're not used to these touch screens, for example, you can just look at the map. So it's very different ways of, of participating and interacting with it. And I think that's important to, um, uh, yeah, to include all user groups that you could imagine. Thank you. And as you just mentioned, I mean, it has been like particularly difficult now in, in like COVID times and, and yeah. talking to users. Uh, has, the, has the museum opened already and, and were you able like, yes. to, to observe uh, real visitors interacting with your installation? It opened, uh, it opened so it, uh, the exhibition is like a new permanent exhibition where this piece is a part of. Uh, it opened there for just a couple of weeks last summer and now again, just two or three weeks ago. So just very recently. So we didn't have the chance yet to, to see how people use it, but we are definitely gonna, gonna do that. Perfect. And maybe one more like visualization specific technical question. So um, you, you talked about like biases in, in, in data gathering also, also in yeah. your paper. So did you in, in, in a way also represent that visually that, that, that there are like some, some, some biases or, or maybe missings uh, here and there? Mm -hmm. um, we... So on, on, I think on the first step we tried to... Um, erase biases in a way in the data. So for example, we had for the very early data set, we had uh, some specific uh, entries with, with names of people who, who got killed. And we decided not to show these names because we felt that it's overrepresenting these uh, these early entries uh, versus the later ones, which are just anonymous because there were so many. Um, and in the visualization itself, we didn't really do it. We explained that the data set is biased, um, but we did not want to uh, artificially uh, alter the visualization to try to hide or, or um, hide the bias. Um, 
because that would be in a way man man manipulated from our point of view. So we we say, okay, we have this bias data and we cannot really do anything about it and we show it as it is. And we also um, invite people to enter further cases and to, to send a mail to the museum and, and give further information so that it gets more complete during throughout the time. Well, that, that, that's a perfect bridge meme. There's one quick question by Jason Dykes who, who yeah. asks, like, is, there, is there a role for the visitors or viewers um, to challenge your design in achieving some of your aims? Um, so can there also be like a way back? Um, yeah, de definitely. I think there's a role. Like we, we, we are happy to to collect feedback, and also the people from the museum. They hear feedback from the guides and stuff like that. Or if if people um, find it interesting, if people under understand um, the design, and 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 if it if it serves the aim that we intended it to be, um, and uh, yeah. I think also the feedback, and we have a feedback uh, form also on the website, and it's it's visible from the outside of the museum. So it's totally possible to get a feedback and and to include it in a further iteration, for example. Okay. Thank you very much, Fabian, again for the uh, presentation and also for the discussion session. Yeah, and now you. we're going to something, I guess, completely different uh, compared to the, the first two topics. Uh, the third uh, talk in this session um, entitled COM8, Visual Analytics for Communication Analysis through Interactive Dynamics Modeling by Maximilian Fischer, Daniel Seebacher, Rita Svestajanabo, sorry, <laughs> Svestajanova, uh, Daniel Keim and Mentala el Basadi. Please, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, I'm Max, a PhD candidate at Daniel Keim's Data Analysis and Visualization Group at the University of Constance, where I'm working at the intersection of data visualization and machine learning to enhance communication analysis. Today, I'm going to present COM8, a visual analytics framework to holistically explore human communication data. Communication data is very heterogeneous and can come in many different forms. For example, we have connectivity information, which can be encoded as graph networks. These show who is communicating with whom and how much. Further, we can have various types of metadata. One of the most basic ones are just the timestamps of individual communication events. At last, we have the content of the communication, which is essential for the meaning that is transported and which we can analyze in many different ways. For example, with the means of natural language processing. In this example, we look for specific post tags, but we can also look for name entities or do sentiment analysis. But when we look at the existing communication analysis frameworks, we see they often only consider either the network aspects or the content aspects separately, but not together. So they cannot easily leverage information from both methods simultaneously. Also, when analyzing the former, we often have graph representations like node link diagrams or sometimes matrices, while for the latter, we have different kinds of text-based visualizations. These gaps, both between analysis modalities as well as different visualization types, makes it difficult to simultaneously investigate across model and aspect boundaries. In our paper, we therefore argue for an holistic approach to communication analysis. In the following, we present COM8, a blueprint prototype for holistic communication analysis through visual analytics. To understand how our prototype works, we look at the system architecture. We start with the raw communication data. In the next step, this data is pre-processed and fed to different analysis levels. Each level is concerned with a specific type of analysis, for example, filtering by time on the metadata or by keyword on the content is supported by the standard tasks. However, the strength of our approach is the ability to integrate other analysis modules. For our prototype, 
we integrated two more advanced concepts, a thematic content analysis using concepts for natural language processing and a conversational dynamics analysis on the communication metadata. Each of the levels has associated properties which allow to control how they work and also associated inline visualizations, which we will talk about later. Before we continue, we look how these levels can work together for a more advanced analysis. Specifically, we leverage a common data model to support combination of these levels. A communication network can be described as a multi-D graph G, with we being a set of vertices representing the communication participants, and M a multi-set of ordered pairs, vertices, representing a communication event. Additional metadata and content can be modeled by defining an information function I, mapping a communication event from the multiset M to a data space D. Individual analysis levels can now be generically defined as operators that act on the vertex space V, the edge space M, and the information function I. All this together forms a graph-like shared data space, which is used internally to store all information and facilitate the analysis. With this knowledge, let's have a look at the architecture again. We, of course, also need a visualization interface. Each analysis level can provide their own embedded visualization, which is integrated in a larger framework. To allow verification and build confidence, the provenance module tracks all interactions. So, in essence, the user can interact via the visualization framework, refine and control the individual level properties, which in turn update the visualization and finally verify the results, which can also be exported to a physical report. For better understanding, let's look at the actual interface. In this view, you see the top layer of the main interface. On the left hand side, you see the communication data displayed in a multi level matrix view, while the properties and provenance are shown on the right in more detail. The senders of the communications are shown as rows, while the receivers are shown as columns. Therefore, each cell entry represents all communication from one person to another in one direction. The highlighted cell, for example, contains the communication sent from Susan Mara to R. Carroll. On the right, each analysis level has its own properties, which act simultaneously on data on the left. The ordering and color scheme can also be changed. And at the bottom, you can see a provenance history graph which shows the current filtering state. What kind of analysis task does our prototype support for the filtering? Remember that the level is similar to an operator that can act on a data space by both filtering or visualizing it. First, there are the standard tasks. Specifically, they are volume, distribution, time filter, user selection, and keyword search. The volume level analyzes the amount of communication. It offers no properties for configuration and has only a view for visualizing its results. The distribution level analyzes the temporal exchange of communication events and also has only a view and no properties. The time filter level now has only properties where one can restrict the time range for the analysis and no view. The user selection level is similar and allows to include or exclude specific users in the data space. The keyword search acts on the content and filters for messages which contain the required keywords. Now to the more advanced levels. The thematic search allows for the content to be filtered for semantic concepts. The user can choose from 18 different concepts to build a query. In this example, the user restricts the search for messages which mention a person together with an organization within a distance of seven routes. Multiple queries are of course possible. Finally, the dynamics view offers insight about the dynamic evolution of the conversations. It is based on the concept of conversational dynamics, 
which we published previously. It uses around a dozen properties of the communication like regularity, imbalance, or density to detect and classify individual communication episodes, which are then visualized in a violin-like visual representation. The visualizations are integrated as one view, but the level also contains properties as one can select relevant communication episodes and then train a machine learning model to filter for similar communication episodes, which we will see later. Before that, let's have a more detailed look at the different view levels we integrated. The idea behind the visualization levels is that the expert can employ different analysis modalities on the same dataset, but within one single view. The multiple levels act similar to a semantic zoom. The volume level shows the amount of communication using a color coding. The darker the cell color, the more communication is contained within it. The distribution view shows the temporal distribution of the communication over time using bar charts. Finally, the dynamics view shows the results from the conversational dynamics level by visualizing the individual communication episodes that have been detected. Now, let's look at all these aspects in action. Here we see the main interface of our approach. On the left, we have the senders. On top, we have the receivers. And in the matrix-like view, we have the communication volume between different persons. On the right-hand side, we have the level properties for the individual analysis levels and can customize them. Now when we zoom in, we can see different analysis levels. For example, the distribution view, or more interestingly, when we zoom in further, one of the custom views from the models we provided using the dynamics. This communication episode structure communication into individual parts and also capture the modality of the communication. You can, for example, click on one such episode and then look at the contained communication content. We can also, for later, mark these episodes as relevant or irrelevant. When we look further on the right, we see the different levels we support, like persons, time, keywords, and then the more advanced ones like thematic query builder and the dynamics view to generate the episodes you have seen on the right. Further, we have different visualization settings. We have different ordering strategies for the matrix, like for example, for example depending on the index, but also the distribution. Or we can also change the color scheme. For example, when we want to have an overview who is communicating less and who is communicating more. To better understand the benefits of our approach, we conducted an extensive evaluation. To show you how the different analysis levels play together in our prototype, we look at the actual use case from our paper. The task is to discover persons in the first nine months of 2001, which disseminated knowledge about legal issues involving persons in combinations with organizations in California and identify a single point of contact. We start by transferring this information into the system. So first, we restrict the time range from the 1st January 2001 to the 30th of September 2001. And then we can just update the visualization and see what happens. So now we restricted the communication levels. The next step is to add um, the keyword California as we want to have this included in here, and also update the visualization. Again, the view was restricted and less communication was shown. The next step is to use the thematic search to use for a search for persons um, in combinations with organizations, and second query, which involves legal issues, which was the requirement from the task. When we update that, we um, wait some time for the natural language processing to conclude. And then we see a much reduced data set. And here we have now two persons as senders and one person as receiving information. We can then go on 
and look at the actual conversation which happened between these persons and look what they talked about. This of course was a very easy example, but it already showed what with existing applications is very hard to do. In the next step here, you want to look at one of the more specific analysis levels which go beyond existing tools at conversation dynamics. For example, when we look at these communication episodes here and click on them, we can see the actual conversation that's contained in this episode. And what we can also do is we can train um, classifiers based on this communication behavior. So for example, let's assume we have, um, want to have more complex interaction, not so single lines like that, and also very one-sided communication. We do not want to have that in our um, restriction. So we select these different um, examples and then train a classifier. And then the system automatically reduces the selected amount that's shown to us and blends out those that things does not match based on the threshold. And when we look through the visualizations here, we see that our expectations are met. The next step, we conducted a formative expert assessment to evaluate the benefits as well as the limitations of our approach. The assessment was conducted with six domain experts. Three experts are law enforcement agents working in the field of communication analysis, two are employees in the security industry, and one is a researcher and professor for security research. All but one of the experts each have more than a decade of experience in digital and criminal investigations. The evaluation took 90 minutes and consisted of an introduction followed by a demo where the experts could steer the exploration process, then a discussion about the approach and a final structured interview using 29 prepared questions. Here we want to quickly summarize the findings. The experts regard the zoomable matrix-based visualization framework as helpful for the analysis, highlighting the improved scalability and the ability to show detailed support information in context rather than on the side. In terms of the multi-level filtering, the experts think it has much potential, as it allows them to conduct more abstract and generic searches across level boundaries. But they also hinted at possible improvements, like more flexible combination of the level filters, for example using a Boolean query language. Regarding the overall applicability of our approach, the experts think it is very broadly applicable to multiple domains with bigger groups of communication data. They regard our prototype as the beginning of an interaction platform for flexible combination of analysis logic. It offers many possibilities and can easily be extended with specific analysis levels based on specialized needs. As the formative expert assessment, did not allow for a detailed study on how the experts used the system, we did an additional user evaluation and presented them with our case study from before. The user study was conducted with two additional communication analysis experts, one law enforcement agent and one research scientist, both being department leads and having more than a decade of experience in the field. The findings support the initial expert assessment. The system proved easy to be used. For the case study, the experts used the system for the first time. Both completed the task correctly, taking between 10 to 15 minutes. The experts especially highlighted that the system naturally supports investigative workflows. Compared to the existing system and workflows, it provides a significant benefit in analytical capabilities. Most notably, it allows the simultaneous application of different search methodologies to support cross-matches. This allows for more powerful queries in contrast to manually merging separate results. So in summary, we described a case study in the area of criminal investigations that show how our approach supports searches across domain boundaries. A formative expert assessment with six communication analysis experts concluded that the system provides increased scalability and analytical capabilities has much potential and is broadly applicable. A user evaluation with two additional communication analysis experts showed that the system is easy to use and aligns well with investigative workflows. 
This highlights that COM8 is easy to use, yet powerful, and offers much potential for communication analysis. Of course, our technique can be improved further. For example, we only integrated two advanced analysis levels so far. Further custom levels could be added to widen the possible analysis capabilities, maybe also depending on user need. Related to that as an extension of the query language and the filter combinations. So far, filters act in combination. This could be adapted to a more advanced Boolean query language, which allows for even more complex filter combinations. Another important aspect is the scalability. The main issue here is the matrix utilization. We imagine that a concept of multiple magic lenses can be used to better use the available screen space. Otherwise, an intelligent layouting which reorders the matrix according to the importance might also be employed. One aspect which is not supported so far are multi-party conversations. This is a relevant research gap, especially when considering particularities to group conversations. The last aspect I want to mention is the evaluation. Here, we could do an additional quantitative user study on a larger scale or use a data set in question from a different domain. So, in summary, this has been COMAID. It enables experts to holistically analyze human communication data by tackling multi level inline visualizations and model view coupling and allowing experts to simultaneously apply different filter modalities and cross model boundaries to support cross matches. If you want to find out more, write to us or visit our website on bit.ly slash comade. So thank you very much for presenting this very interesting combination of, of network and content analysis. So I personally can see a very broad range of potential applications as you already mentioned at, uh, on, on the last slide. Um, and also congrats to the nice formatting of the paper, by the way, uh, this nice use of, of, of symbols collecting the text and the figures helps a lot um, to, to read it better. Um, and it's also very nice to see this um, notion of the provenance graph as a core element also in your, in your system already. And to kick off the, the discussion, maybe like one question more on the technical side, you could you elaborate a little bit more like on the implementation on prototype fidelity of, of the actual status of the prototype? Yeah, sure. So in, in principle, the prototype is based on the web app. So the front end is a web app and the back end is a um, Python based framework with include several different models, for example, natural language processing and then standard NLP um, modules in there, but also custom modules for the specific analysis levels. And then we have different filtering modalities in there and basically a data import in the backend and everything, most of the analysis actually happens in Python. And then we go on to the front end and just visualize the results there, but allow basically a, a, a loop which goes back for the refinement of the modeling. In terms of the prototype, it's um, somewhat finished. We're still refining it a bit um, to get it ready. And our hope is that we can um, somewhere this year publish it maybe online so everybody can try it out. We're still working on basically getting the model and the imports ready. It's the main parts and then cleaning up the code a bit. So, so you're, you're planning on, on releasing it publicly? Um, yeah, I think it's a really nice tool because, um, as I said, we, we did a study in criminal investigations where, of course, it's not such a public area, but I think it can be applied in um, different areas like investigative journalism, for example, or business intelligence. And there, I think it would be a nice uh, tool to have for this person. Re relating to that, so what, what are the languages you are supporting as you are also do the language processing? Um, obviously, that makes a difference. Of course, so um, so far, I think English is our only language we support, but um, we are relying mainly for the analysis there on the usual NLP pipeline, so we can easily integrate other languages, so it becomes an issue of adding it, basically. So I think that the main languages should be easy to support. Um, smaller languages might be difficult because NLP research is um, not that accurate in these areas, and there's still a lot of work to be done. 
and and uh, towards the end in, in in terms of like talking about future future work you also mentioned scalability in, mainly in the sense of of visualization or visual scalability of applying like magic lenses and intelligent layering mm -hmm. what about like the the computational side of things so um what sizes of of documents uh, like uh, databases did you did you test it with already so we we worked on the n1 data set which has around um yeah, just um, some hundreds of thousands of emails, basically, and um, several persons, like 150 persons, I think, and a lot of emails in there. And in terms of computational analysis, the problem isn't that much because you can scale it, you can distribute it, and do basically just um, use different runners and um, approximations there. And the visualization side it comes all together, and that's the main issue, I think. Okay. And, and as, as uh, one, one other application area, you already mentioned it. So I also thought about like data journalism as, yes. as a very, very useful user group here that leaks documents and, and, and things that, that have been analyzed in, in the past. I think they can very much profit from, from your work in, in that sense. Okay, so then I would like to thank you, Max, again for the discussion and also for the presentation of the work of yourself and your colleagues. And want to continue uh, with presenting the final paper of this session, which is called Pro BGP Progressive Visual Analytics of Live BGP Updates by Alex Ulmer, David Ses David Sessler, and Jörn Kohlhammer. Please go ahead. My name is Alex Ulmer and I will present you our work with David Sessler and Jörn Kohlhammer on ProBGP, Progressive Visual Analytics of Live BGP Updates. First, I want to start with a short explanation of the most important terms, so everyone can follow the presentation. BGP is the border gateway protocol. It is the glue of the internet infrastructure. With BGP, routing information is exchanged to reach all destinations in the world. These routes are exchanged for certain IP blocks between autonomous systems. IP blocks are written as in the prefix format you can see here. The last 16 bits are not set, so this IP block is written with the starting address followed by a slash 16. So there are 65,534 IP addresses in this prefix. To make it easier, we will call IP blocks just prefix. ASs are divided into three tiers, ranging from global tier 1 transit ASs to local tier 3 internet service providers. Let's look at a short example on how BGP updates work. We start with AS3, a tier 3 AS which owns a prefix and now wants to make it accessible over the internet. AS3 sends a BGP update to AS2, which forwards it to AS1. AS1 is a global network and shares the update with many peers. One of those peers is a log data collector, which records the BGP update and sends it to the next hop. What we get is a log entry like this. With the current time at AS4, the prefix, the AS path 3214, and the next hop IP address. But what if there is an AS6, which also got the update and forwarded it to AS1? Our log data would change, but is this a regular alternative route or already a suspicious detour? And this is the motivation of our work. We want to find those suspicious paths. There have been multiple events in the past with major effects on large parts of the internet. One example is the false announcement of the Pakistan Telecom, where they claimed to own prefixes of YouTube. Because of that, many users from Asia were led to a white page when accessing YouTube. Another event from 2019 was a route leak from Safehost Switzerland. They forwarded prefixes which they learned from their neighbors to their provider China Telecom. Because China Telecom is a higher tier AS and Safehost is their customer, Safehost should only send their own prefixes to China Telecom. 
China Telecom, on the other hand, did not filter these updates, which led to a worldwide effect of routing large amounts of traffic over safe hosts' network. This is much easier to understand with a geospatial visualization. But the big problem is that the log data is very large and continuously growing. We are talking about approximately 6 gigabytes of text data on each collector every day. We created a novel geographic visual analytics service where you can access all log data from 10 years ago until today. This is possible with progressive methods for data processing and visualization, which I want to show you now in a demo. Our prototype can be found at probgp.igd.fraunhofer.de. On the home page is some general information. The VIS tab shows the world map with our query inputs. At first I want to load a cached result to show you the visualization features. Later we will look at the data of the safe host route leak, which is also our use case in the paper. In the top left you can enter the prefix you are interested in. After specifying the time frame, the data is sent from the cache database. We are looking at an almost 9 hour time frame of a prefix owned by Fraunhofer IGD in Germany. You can immediately see how the BGP updates are spread around the world. There is only one origin marked in pink, which shows that only one AS owns this prefix. Apart from a few multi-origin prefixes, this should be the regular case. Multiple pink dots, meaning multiple origins, could be an indicator for a false announcement also called a BGP prefix hijack. At the bottom is a histogram which shows how many updates were recorded during the time frame. The visualization can be used to filter the paths. A path can be selected which will show the AS numbers at each data center to see where the BGP updates switch to another AS. In the top right, a window with more detailed information for the BGP update is shown. There, the user can see the raw data and hover over the AS numbers to query the official RIPE routing information service. More details on the ASs involved in the BGP update are then displayed. Below the AS numbers, colors highlight the tier of the AS. This makes it easier to spot suspicious paths because of the AS tier hierarchy. Usually there should be a lower AS at the start or at the end of the AS path with some higher tier ASs in the middle, which are not interrupted by lower tier ASs. Now we will go over to a non-cached query of the safe host route leak of 2019. After the query is started, the log data from around 50 collectors distributed around the world is downloaded. All BGP updates are processed progressively and immediately sent to the visualization. The first path is already visible after 12 seconds. This time we are only looking at a 14 minute time frame, but there are many more paths than in the previous example. The user can already interact with the histogram at the bottom to filter the data so that only paths relevant are added to the visualization. There are multiple routes with long detours visible. We can select one of them and see how the path has a major detour from Switzerland to China. A deeper look at the AS path also shows that the AS tier hierarchy is not in order. You can see how the tier 3 AS 21217, which learned the route from tier 2 AS 13237, propagates it to AS 4134. In this case, it would cause the routing of packets from South Africa to go over China to reach the origin in Luxembourg. And now back to the slides. Our prototype was inspired by previous works on BGP update visualization. The first is BGP Viewer by Papadopoulos et al. They aggregated BGP updates and visualized the amount as circles for each country where an update was originated. With this, the change of IP ownership can be observed very well. 
The other related work I want to highlight here is Bigfoot by Siam Kumar et al. They draw a bounding polygon around the locations of prefixes belonging to one AS. This method makes false announcements visible, but also may suffer from overplotting when looking at a global tier 1 AS. The main downside they have in common is that they have a low geographic accuracy. So how did we achieve a higher geographical accuracy like seen in the demo? We developed an approximation algorithm which uses GeoIP data to estimate AS data centers. We built on top our previous work on GeoIP data, which you can see here. It shows the locations for almost all IP addresses in the world. We took this data and aggregated it with a hybrid solution of the KD tree and dbscan algorithms to approximate the AS data centers. But this is just the first step to get the paths you have seen. After we have the data centers, we have to approximate the internal network of the ASs. And finally, we use the AS networks to approximate the BGP update path. All approximations have constraints which we derived from our multiple evaluation interviews with domain experts. You can read more details about the constraints in the paper. Let's start with the first step. We had some problems with dbscan and the KD tree. On the left you can see how dbscan aggregated too many locations away from the data center. On the right the KD tree generated clusters in low density areas. To overcome the violations of the constraints we developed a hybrid solution where dbscan is used inside the KD tree. We chose very robust thresholds to have good results for local and global ASs. But this also led to single locations being marked as a data center, which you can see on the right. We fixed this with a post-processing step to filter or merge data centers on the city level. The next step is to create the internal AS network. We used Kruskal's minimal spanning tree algorithm to have an efficient starting point. As edge weights, we use the distance between the data centers, combined with their managed IP addresses. Based on the constraints, we iteratively add edges which reduce the path between data centers by more than 30%. Finally, we approximate the BGP update path. Therefore, we look at the AS path and do the first two steps for each AS. In this example, you can see three AS networks for which we want to find the path from the origin to the next hop. First, we determine peering point candidates and connect them with an edge. In the best case, the edge should have zero length, but due to inaccurate GeoIP data, this might not always be the case. Now we have one large connected graph where we use the A star algorithm to find the shortest path. Now we switch to the prototype and look at an example approximation of the tier 1 AS174 by Cogent. In the top left we can enter the AS number 174 and select the date of which we want to use the GeoIP data from. After hitting the query button the approximation algorithm starts to calculate all three steps. After a few seconds the approximated internal network is visualized. On the bottom left we can hide different layers of the visualization to better follow the steps of the approximation. Let's start to look at the raw AS prefix locations. These are all locations for prefixes owned by Kogan's AS174. Hovering over a white dot will display the prefix size. Then we enable the data center layer to see how our hybrid KD tree and DB scan worked. The color of the dots shows how many IP addresses were aggregated in a data center. Hovering over the data center shows the aggregated number of IPs. Finally, we enable the internal network layer again to see the whole approximation result. We chose Kogant as the example because they are one of the few top tier ASs that provide a detailed network map with internal connections. Like you can see in the direct comparison, 
we have an overestimation in North America and an underestimation in Europe, which shows how difficult it is to implement balanced thresholds while maintaining the constraints. Approaching the end of the presentation, I want to show you some of our evaluation results. Like mentioned before, we had multiple interviews with domain experts from RIPE and DKIX during our development cycles. With the interviews, we were able to talk to both of our targeted user groups, which were internet service providers and internet regulators. There were very valuable suggestions, which you can read in the paper. For now, I want to show you some quantitative evaluation results. We performed an evaluation against the peering database as suggested by the reviewers. PeeringDB is a free database where providers can put in their data center locations. Unfortunately, only about 30% of AS owners did this. For AS174, which I showed you in the demo, we have a precision of 84% and a recall of 93%. Looking at the top 10 tier ASs, we still have a good precision of 73% and a recall of 78%. Adding all tier 1 and tier 2 ASs brings down our precision to 38%. This is mainly because of the missing ground truth data. So now you have seen how our novel geographic visual analytic system works. More about the progressive processing can be found in the paper. Our next steps will be to integrate the ground truth directly in our approximation. Automatic highlighting of suspicious paths is also a future challenge. Thank you for watching. Thank you very much for the presentation. I think it's a very nice combination of automated analysis components and um, highly interactive visual interface. And there, uh, as we've seen, are many different layers of challenges that you that you uh, tackled in, in your work. Uh, there is also already one, one question um, targeting towards the, the technical layer of these challenges. Um, so um, um, I have a question by Christian Tominski and he asks, how is uh, the concurrency or progressiveness implemented in the background? So that was a really great challenge uh, because there are these collectors that are collecting the log data and there are approximately 50 of them around the world. And they just store the data like in 15 minute dumps or five minute dumps. And depending on the location, for example, a big router in Europe just collects uh, six gigabytes of text data a day. So we can say approximately 50 minutes have like 500 megabytes or something like that. And we just have to download at first this big block. So you have just this time to download. And because we are downloading from all the 15 uh, collectors, this takes some time. That's why we had this. 12 seconds for the first response but this was the main challenge because we had so many different collectors and if the user enters a time frame that's larger than 50 minutes like one hour or the nine hours from the example in the paper then everything takes a lot of time and we tried as best as we could to parallelize everything to download from all location at once and process the data but it's it's still a little bit uh challenging for the hardware that we have. So the prototype is not running on multiple clusters, just on one server. And that was still a little bit of a limiting factor. Okay, thank you. Maybe related to that uh, question by Max Fischer, and as you as you wrote in your paper, not all BGP updates are locked. So smaller anomalies might, might go undetected. So are you aware of any approaches that, that can deal with that? Yeah, we are currently in the in the Athene Center here in Darmstadt. We are working together with the Nauer Fraunhofer Institute uh, directly on this topic because these 50 collectors are really leaving some black holes on the logging space. So we are currently investigating where the big biggest black holes are to maybe put more sensors or log collectors in this part. So currently we are just limited to this. Thank you. Another question by, by Jason Dykes that, that I also um, um, noted was like this uh, geometric um, distortions, 2D projections, um, and using different map projections. Um, uh, how was the decision made to, to go with the design that you have now? So there was mainly the limitation of the performance. So because we have this web service and we want to display a large amount of uh, data, uh, we went with the WebGL solution. 
And this was basically the main decision point because if, if we try to use like Google Maps or something, uh, not with WebGL, we ran into strong limitating factors. So the website was just freezing and we were not responsive enough anymore. And this was the, the best solution for the performance. And maybe relating to that also, like in um, a comment by, by Christian Tominski, again, is it like alternative to the map display? Like what about a 3D globe? So where you don't have the problems like of, of, of the projections there? Yeah, there are some solutions uh, which I also th I think mentioned in the paper and the related work that use the 3D globe, uh, we think it's it's very difficult to view everything on the world map because if I have a path from like Europe to Australia, then first I have to rotate the globe to even see the whole path. And this is why we decided against uh, 3D. And um, maybe also a question related more on, on the data side, and you also discussed it in, in, in your papers that this GUIP you're using um, as, as a data source is, is in itself like an ex approximation of, of the positional information. So as you also um, showed in your slides, there is a lot of like uncertainty also with the data and a lot of approximation. Did you think about like also visually uh, showing these uncertainties in a way? So we have some in uncertainty data for the GIP data, but it's, it's very diverse. So sometimes we have some IP blocks, which are like with a accuracy of 10 kilometers, but then we get an IP block with has, has like an accuracy of 1000 kilometers. So it's, it's really difficult to, to visualize the uncertainty because if we just increase uh, the size of the, of the dots or work with opacity then we get a lot of overplotting and that's very difficult in this case but we also we, we try to incorporate this but it's still ongoing research and, and maybe also going back a bit to the to the uh, question of like maps and, and projections when, when i was looking at at your your demo you had uh, as, as part of the of the presentation i was thinking about like maybe applying something like um, distortions or focus plus context because you have like very dense areas and then there's like long distances covered um did you look into that as a, as a possible solution uh, so what we looked into something like edge bundling for for this most route over the atlantic ocean like from great britain to the usa many routes are going over this so this would be a good application but uh, we noticed if we if we use this edge bundling we have to use it only in certain regions because if if we go deeper into a local space and start with edge bundling there then we also give the user some false information because of this approximation of this bundling. So it's definitely a future work that we would like to integrate, like also for some penalties on waterways. So not everywhere there are cables under the water. So uh, there we have to get a little bit more uh, precise. Okay, thank you. And maybe one, one uh, follow up on, on that um, in terms of visualization. Uh, I mean, obviously, there are a lot of lines like uh, very densely um, and a lot of oak plotting also happening uh, when you, especially when you look at like larger uh, time frames. Um, so did you think about any kind of aggregations or, or any way to, to, to deal with that over plotting uh, challenges? Yeah, we, we try to tackle that because with the zooming mechanism, so you can select uh, a line and if there are lines already on the same path, then they are all already aggregated. So if you select one line, all the log data is uh, visualized on the right side in this pop-up. So we aggregate it if they are really the same, but uh, not yet similar. Okay. okay. Uh, maybe an interesting also practical question by Matthew News, uh, who asks, what do ISPs currently use to visualize these BGP routes? So we talked with uh, RIPE and their favorite tool is uh, BG Play. So this is like a uh, uh, node link diagram visualization where you can also select a certain AS or an, a prefix. And then you just get an, an visualization of a of node link diagram and you can like play uh, through the updates and then these links are animated and they change. But for me, it was really difficult if, if you don't have expertise in this field. So you don't know if this is a correct route change from this uh, node to this node, or is it okay? So with the geographic part, we, we can say, okay, 
we filter to a time frame and then we see are there two routes from the same start and to different ends and uh, you can get more insights without this expertise needed. Okay, so thank you very much again, Alex, for the discussion and also for the presentation of the paper. Thanks to all the speakers of the sessions and all the core authors of the very interesting works we have seen so far. Uh, thanks also to the technical support and to, to Gabriela for uh, as our um, uh, student volunteer who supported us uh, for running the session. So with that, I'm closing the session. Thank you for being part of it and see you in the next session. Bye.